It's a great joy to have our dear friends, Pastor Tommy and Wanda Reed with us from Buffalo, New York. Uh, Pastor Tommy is the emeritus pastor of the Tabernacle in Orchard Park, a church that he pastored for 50 years and uh, just turned over the congregation a couple of months ago to a new leadership team. He is a visionary. He is a church planter. He is an author. He is uh, a Christian television host and a producer and more than all of those things he is a father in the Lord you know Paul said you have thousands of teachers but not many fathers and we are so blessed today uh, to be in the presence of a real father in the faith and I want to say that Pastor Tommy and Wanda have had such a huge impact on our ministry Denise and I our lives have been changed um, many years ago when I first became the senior pastor of this church uh, I went to a very special meeting in Buffalo with a man called David Cartledge who was an apostle from Australia and those meetings changed my life and we've had the opportunity to go up to Buffalo on several occasions and each time um, the Lord has deposited something in us. A couple of years ago, there was a conference with uh, Casey Tree and Bob Rogers and Jim Morocco. I just found out Jim Morocco's cousin comes to church here, Pastor. I just found that out in the second service. So he's going to come here. Um, but the Lord spoke to me at that conference about planting churches in this area and taking the, the, DNA, the DNA, the spiritual DNA that God has deposited in this house and, and infecting other communities in this region in Fairfield and Westchester County with that. I want to ask you to stand on your feet, give your best Harvest Time welcome for our friend, Pastor Tommy Reed. God bless you. You may be seated. Just welcome one more time, Pastor Tommy Reed. And thank you. It's good to be here this morning. And uh, I apologize to Pastor Jeremy and Amy for having to hear the same sermon again. But uh, uh, we do have something that we need to share and want to share with you this morning about God's destiny for your life. Uh, we did bring some product with us. I don't try to sell very much, but I have to start with an apology. We've sold out completely of our book. Uh, we're going to talk about dreams this morning. We wrote this book, one, and every, it was gone, almost all of them are gone before the last service. And so uh, if you would like one of these after we preach this morning, uh, first of all, we've done it in video, so you, the video copy is still available, which you'll see some of that this morning. But... Uh, uh, we have this book which uh, has a whole workbook in it about how to find God's dream for your life. And since this is the last one, can I give it away? Miller, this is for you. All right, I've already signed it to you. Dream God's dream, buddy. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of uh, Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. Let me make a statement and opening. Did you know that you have a destiny in your life? Turn to the person beside you and say you have destiny. Will you do that? I, uh, when I preach, I have, I have this strange thing that goes through my mind. Here's what I think about. What can I do this morning or this evening, whenever the time is, to number one, help people discover their destiny because I have no idea. Maybe some of your destinies is to be the President of the United States. Maybe it's to be the Ambassador of the United Nations. Maybe it's to build the biggest company in the Northeast. Maybe it's to pastor a church. Maybe it's to start a college. Maybe it's to be a missionary. Maybe it is to fly airplanes. You know, but somewhere God has a destiny for you. Uh, if you'd go to who's who, uh, you would find my profile, and what it would say is this. Tommy Reed believes that every person has dignity, purpose, and destiny, and it's his life's work to try to help people discover that. So I want you to discover it this morning. I know we can't do much to get you to discover it except to excite you. Here are these words concerning a man by the name of Joseph. I met a boy this morning whose name was Joseph, and I had to say, 
Do you know who Joseph was in the Bible? And he, well, he kind of acted like he didn't know. I think he really did. I said, Joseph was a dreamer. Listen to this, verse 5 of chapter 37. Now, Joseph had a dream. Verse 9. Then he dreamed still another dream. And he said, look, I have dreamed another dream. Father, help us to dream God's dream for our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. This morning, I want to talk to you about your destiny. I knew as an early, at an early time in my life what my destiny was. You may not, but I hope that I can help you discover that this morning. Now, the way that God communicates our destiny to us is through a language. I want to talk to you about the language of destiny. Let me ask you a question. What language do you think God spoke when he came to the Garden of Eden to talk to Adam and Eve? Anybody have an idea? Do you think he spoke English? I think he spoke Korean, Chinese, Spanish. What, what did he speak? I think I know. Let me tell you what I think. I don't know, I think. I think that he probably spoke a language that most of us don't really comprehend very well. It was a language of thought. I think Adam knew what God was thinking, and I think that God knew what Adam was thinking, and they communicated through this unbelievable thought process. We know how that works a little bit because some people are kind of psychic by nature. They kind of read your mind. My wife does that to me. I don't always like that, but uh, she always knows what I'm thinking. That's the language I think that God spoke. In a way, he speaks that same kind of language because when he gives us destiny, he also communicates it through something we call dreams. That's what happened to Joseph. He dreamed a dream about his future. All of us have dreams, like Joseph. Maybe sometime eight, nine, ten years of age, all of us have dreams. Most of us don't hear them. We kind of know, but we don't make anything of them. Maybe your dream is you're going along the road and, and all of a sudden there's an accident and you help somebody and you rescue somebody. What does that mean? And then recurringly you have that or you think about that. What does that mean? Is it possible that that dream is something about the purpose God has for you in life that you're supposed to rescue people? Could be. Maybe you have a dream of building buildings, and you've had that dream ever since you were young. Maybe God wants you to be an award-winning architect. Anyway, whatever life is, the way God communicates his destiny for us is through dreams. Either we hear them, we believe them or don't believe them, and we do them or throw them away. Now... What I want to do this morning is I want to encourage you to dream. Will you let me do that? Let me encourage you to dream this morning. A few weeks ago, the man who's the successor in my church that's preached for you here, Brother Robert Stearns, posted something on Facebook, and let me read it to you. Here are his words. I was caught up in the spirit and was brought to a place of enormous ancient gates. The gates were covered over with debris. They were overrun with neglect. The gates were enormous. They were guarding a place of great authority and great power. The question arose in my heart, what can it be that these gates guard that's behind them and that if you open them, they release? As I stood before the gates, the wind of God began to blow upon them. Stronger and stronger with increasing force, the breath of God began to blow away the debris that was covering the gates. As the wind increased with greater force, I saw the name of the gates written on top of them. Their name was imagination. And I heard the Lord say, access to creativity and the power of imagination 
which has been locked up and withheld by the spirit of religion and earthly wisdom will now be released. But now the Lord says, I will open these gates to my people. I will gather a holy global nation unto me to the sound and light of holy imagination. Their peoplehood, the image of God, will be restored as they think my thoughts. Remember, you have the mind of Christ and dream my dreams. For I, the Lord, have created humanity in my image, holy and pleasing to me. As the anointing of imagination is released with great impact, the image of my children will be healed from their brokenness and in a moment as the glory of holy imagination is released. One day two people came in my office and they conveyed to me a message. It was, I'm sure, well meant. It didn't make me feel very good, but it was well meant, I'm sure. And they told me some things I already knew. They said, you're nearing 80 years of age and uh, it's time you retire. I kind of agree with that. I, I think at 80 you deserve some retirement. I'm not sure what that's all about. I work harder now and longer hours than I used to anyway. But, uh, but anyway, I thought, yeah, you're probably right. And then they said, if you don't do that because it needs a younger pastor, there won't be a church here in five years. I'm not sure I like that statement very well. But when they left, I got on my knees and I said, Lord, what did you say to me? I will always be grateful for this meeting. It changed my life. Because when I ask the statement, God, what did you say to me? You see, my mind works like this. I don't know how yours works. My mind works like this. When somebody does something or says something, I know there's two messages. They're what they're trying to say to me. But there's something that God is saying through it. So I said, Lord, what, I, what did you just say to me? And all of a sudden, I heard these words just bellowing up from within my belly. And these were the words. How do you resign a church that's in your heart, in your dreams? And I remember when that was said to me, I remembered my childhood. I was a boy, eight, nine years of age. And I would go to the altar and a little Assemblies of God church. And there I would hear the voice of God. Now, by hearing, I don't mean I heard an audible sound. But I heard it by the fact that I would enter into a, a dream, a vision, and I would see a church. It was different than the church I was in. The church I was in was small, about 30, 40, 50 people at the most. If we had 60 in Sunday school, we had a lot. It was just a very tiny little church. There were only three wage earners in the church in the 1930s, my dad and two other people. Hardly enough to pay the bills and let alone give the pastor a salary. It was very small. But in the altar, I would see another church. I would see a great building, a large building. I'd see hundreds of people. And I'd say happy faces. And I would see a man in the pulpit. And it would be me as a grown-up. And it was so real that I could touch it. So real I could touch it. And I would wake up like a person in two worlds. There was a world inside of me. And there was world around me. It was like Henry Ford. The world inside of him saw America on wheels. The world around him saw a world that had no roads. It had no gas stations. The world inside of him was different than the world around him. How do you take something inside of you and create it in the world around you? Well, for me, because I was a stutterer, and I couldn't speak, and but my dream was to be a preacher. Because I was unhealthy and had one problem after another in my health, and because I had lack of coordination, I couldn't catch a ball because I couldn't see it. I had all of these physical impairments. My dad was a professional athlete, professional football player, professional boxer, and here was his son without any athletic ability because I had these physical things wrong with me. I thought, how can I be a preacher? And yet, that was the dream that was inside of me. And one day I was stricken with polio. And as I realized that in the natural I would never walk again, I saw my first miracle. And my first miracle was me. I want to take you in the video we've made of the book. And I'd like to show you 
a little clip from that, it's about three minutes in length, of how God healed me. We went to the very place where it happened. We went to the same, we got the same furniture that I slept on, Roycroft furniture. Now it's a collector's item. So we got some of that furniture and we actually filmed this on that furniture. Went to the very house where I took my first step. Here's the story of my miracle, let's see it. I'm sorry, Tommy. The pastor won't be available until tomorrow. But mom, today is the day. I'm sorry, sweetie. Today is the day I will be healed. I need pastor to pray for me. I am with you. I will heal you. Can I please have some milk? What's that, honey? Tommy, why are you walking? I told you, Mom. Today is the day I will be healed. Now, can I please have some milk? That was the last of it. So you'll either have to go to the store and get some, or lap it up. I will get some. Tommy took the hand of Jesus, this little cripple boy began to walk and begin his journey with him. He began to talk to the one whose hand he held. A young man. My parents moved me from Buffalo, New York to Springfield, Missouri. I was all alone, just ready to leave my 11th year and go into my 12th. I had no friends. I moved away from them. And I would get up in the morning and say, God, I just, I just need a friend. I don't have anybody. I don't have anybody my age. Everybody around here is older. I live in a college. I do, nobody's here is my age. And none of the teachers have children my age. God, I, I need a friend. And one day a little 
young man, two years younger than me, came up the driveway of the Bible college, had an old rusted out squeaky bicycle, and as the squeaks came across the lawn, I ran out and I said, held up my hand and said, my name's Tommy, what's yours? And he said, my name is Paul. And uh, Paul and I got acquainted. Paul was the son of a missionary from Egypt. On the way home, his father died, and he had nothing. Mom and dad were very, very poor, even when they were missionaries, and now dad was gone, and there was no support. And They came home and had a little tiny house, and my parents bought him his clothes, and we became friends and became my little brother. But Paul had a dream. It was an amazing dream. This is the way I learned about it. We were children. I was 12 and he was 10. And, and he told me about his dream. And he, he dreamed, first of all, he had a movie camera his dad had given him. He could, couldn't use it because there was no film. It was World War II. It was, we couldn't get any film for it. And he dreamed of making movies. And so we'd bring out the movie camera and we'd look at it and he'd dream, someday I'll be a movie maker. Someday I will produce films. And then he... Then we got some more surplus transmitters and we would sit at those transmitters and he would dream of broadcasting. There was no television. It was before those days, World War II in the 1940s. Nobody had seen a television. So he didn't know about that. He knew about it, but never seen one. And so he dreamed of broadcasting. And I lived with those dreams every day of my life. I have a movie camera I usually carry with me when I get to this part of the teaching. It's exactly like the one that Paul had. I remember when we got our, after World War II, we got our first film, and he went out and began to film. And uh, I remember our first film. I've still got it. It's a late millimeter reel. And the film is uh, the cars they were making after World War II. Well, Paul lived out his dreams. I watched him. I watched him make movies. In fact, he on Dr. Cho in 1962 for me. He made films all over the world they went. He finally built his first television station. And then he built a second one and a third one until he built the largest television network in the entire world. Billions of dollars worth of television stations. My friend, my little brother, Paul Crouch. He made the video for me. And he says in the video, Tommy, we're both dreamers. He's 70, he was 78, he's gone to be the Lord now. I was 80. Let both of us never stop dreaming. The last thing that he did for me was to make this video. Did about four minutes on it. He talked about telling all the things we did as kids. And then he says, as he looks in the camera, don't ever stop dreaming. One of the hardest days of my life was the day that Paul went home to be with the Lord. I lost a dreamer. But every day I see what he dreamed. Every day I see what he dreamed. I close with a story of Charles Luckman. Charles Luckman was a, was a shoeshine boy at Mulebach Hotel in Kansas City, Missouri, where Harry Truman used to come every day and have coffee. And uh, Charles Luckman, the boy, the shoeshine boy, dreamed of building things. He, they were putting up skyscrapers in Kansas City then. They were building the community. It was growing and, and it was exploding and there were buildings going up. And Charles Luckman said, someday I'm going to build buildings. So he saved up money by shining shoes. He was the best at doing that. Saved money shining shoes and, uh, and saved enough money to put himself through college to become an architect. And he graduated from the University of Illinois. The reason this story means a lot to me is because I have in my library a book that he wrote, a signed copy to me. So I kind of relive his story. Charles Luckman couldn't find a job at 
at building buildings, and so he got a job for Peps and a toothpaste. And eventually worked his way up to the sales manager, Peps, and it became so successful because Charles Luckman was the greatest salesman in the world. He, uh, he memorized the names of 3,500 druggists across America and pharmacists so he could sell them toothpaste. And he'd call them by name and say, how much pepsinant do you have on your shore, in your shelves? And it exploded the growth of pepsinant. Pepsinant got big enough that it finally purchased Lever Brothers and became the Lever Brothers company. And he was the president. Until he was on the front cover of Time Magazine as the most successful business entrepreneur of the 1930s. He had called him the wonder boy of business. But at 40 some years of age, he had not fulfilled his dream. He'd become the best at something other than his dream. And so he quit. People thought he was crazy. He could have built the biggest empire, business empire in the world, but he quit. To go back to his dream, at almost 50 years of age, he became an architect once again and opened a little tiny office to start all over. His book is called Second Chance. Did he succeed? <laughs> you know he succeeded because dreams come to pass. Charles Luckman built Madison Square Gardens, the Prudential Center in Boston, the Kennedy Space Center, the Mann Space Center, and projects across this, num this, uh, this nation of ours and the world that made him the most successful architect of the decade. And he started when he finished his career. You know, Moses was 80. Abraham was 100 before he got his dream. I, I wondered when I turned 80, can you still dream? I'm telling you, this stuff inside of me I'm, scares me because you can still dream. Believe me, age has nothing to do with it. If you're 60 years old and you think you can't dream, age has nothing to do with it, sir. There's things inside of you that go beyond because what's inside of you is greater than what's around you because what's inside of you will be like what's inside of Jesus. If there's a storm outside and there's peace inside, the peace overcomes the storm. That's the wonder about dreams. That's the wonder about purpose. That's the wonder about destiny. Because inside of us, there's a world that's greater than the world around us. And there's a church inside of a church. I want to read you the last paragraph of another book I wrote. I was praying one day after... We succeeded in Buffalo and built a church then of almost between 1,500 and 2,000 people. One night, God showed me the world from afar. The earth was dark except for a few faint lights. The lights were all atop church steeples. Each one lighted the little circle of ground around it. One of those steeple lights was my own. As I looked at my vision, I said, that's my church, I cried, pointing, that's my church. Then God showed me the world again. The church steeples only lighted little circles. But now I saw other lights. I learned, leaned down. I took a closer look. And I saw the church. The lights were coming from thousands of homes. This, said God in my dream, is my church. It's bigger. And when you come into this building today, remember there's a church in the side of the heart of this man that's bigger than anything you see around you. And that church is about to happen in a way you have never known before. Father, may the hand of the Lord be upon these people and this congregation, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.
I don't know about you, but I'm going to go find some place and cry for a little while. Aren't you so glad that the Lord sent a father in the faith to come and just download to us? Come on, would you stand on your feet? Would you give the Lord a great big praise in this place this morning? Come on, let's give Jesus a great big praise. Hallelujah. 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 There's a, there's a table set up out in the foyer. Uh, Pastor was signing uh, books and, and some of the different things. The books are all gone. Uh, Saturday night at 8.30 were so greedy. They just bought everything out. And uh, uh, 10 o'clock got a little bit. But uh, there's a couple things that you can do. First of all, um, Pastor doesn't sell the books, but uh, he was receiving donations which are going to a project that they're doing in the Philippines. They're building a ranch in the Philippines and they're developing it so that they can rescue children out of the sex trafficking industry and save them and give them a home and a place. And so all the donations for the books and videos were going towards that. Um, you can still give a donation this morning and we're going to take your name. We're going to take your email address on a list. And uh, I want you to stop by the table and just touch pastor and let him touch you. Um, there's nothing like receiving the touch of a father in the Lord. So stop by our friend Jeremy and Amen and to just deposit in us, to impart to us, Lord, your word. Father, I pray, Lord, this would be a night. I pray that this would be a week of reawakening dreams, Lord, of refreshing dreams, Lord. Father, uh, for every person who has said, you know, I'm too old, I'm too far spent, uh, uh, too much time has gone by. Too many other things have happened along the way. Too many detours. I, I can't possibly do that thing that I dreamed about. I pray that you would refresh the dream. I pray that you'd renew the dream. I pray that you'd enlarge the dream. Father, I pray that you'd add to the dream. Joseph dreamed a dream, and then he dreamed another dream, and then he dreamed another dream. Daniel dreamed a dream, and then he dreamed again, and he dreamed again. Father, I pray that you'd just fall on your people and that we dream again. Father, I pray, Lord, that you'd awaken hope. I pray that you'd impart faith, Lord. God, I pray that you'd give us hearts of courage to believe that what you have deposited inside of us is greater than anything going on around us. Father, we thank you. And as we go our own way, I pray the cloud of your presence would envelop us. Pray that your protection would surround us. Pray that your provision would accompany us. Pray that your providence would lead us and your peace encircle us until we come together again. And everyone said, amen and amen. God bless you, everyone. Have a great week in Jesus. If anybody wants prayer, you can come forward. Our pastors will be here to meet you. Bless you.